Now, did you know that uh, Talk was one of the first rock albums ever recorded entirely on a computer? Now, despite this groundbreaking use of digital technology, it became one of Yassi's most forgotten and really commercially disappointing releases. It was caught somewhere between 70s prog rock ambition and 90s pop rock polish, and a music world that had already moved on to grunge. Who or what was to blame? Let's take a closer look. So today we're looking at the album Tour. This was Yassi's 14th studio album, released in 1994. Now this album is a fascinating case study in a band trying to navigate a dramatically changing musical landscape whilst dealing with internal dynamics that were pulling them in different directions. It had all the elements for something great, strong musicianship, a history of success, and innovative production. But ultimately, Talk failed to live up to its potential. Let's break down five key areas where I feel the album fell short. Now, the first major issue with Talk is the lack of cohesion between the band members. Yes, at this point was in a transitional period. The lineup on Talk, John Anderson, Chris Squire, Trevor Rabin, Tony Kay and Alan White was the same Yes West group that had had huge success with 90125 a decade earlier. But by 1994, there was a noticeable shift in the internal dynamics of the band. Trevor Rabin, who had become an essential figure in Yes during the 1980s, he essentially took full control of the productive and creative direction for tour. Now Raven's really a fantastic musician. He's an incredibly skilled guitarist, producer and songwriter. But in this case, his near total control created a problem. Yes, it always thrived in collaboration, especially during their progressive rock heyday. Albums like Close to the Edge and Fragile, these were as a result of multiple creative voices, working together to craft a layered, intricate sound. But on Talk, that balance wasn't there. Rabin's influence was so dominant that it sidelined other key members of the band, particularly Chris Squire, whose bass work, normally a defining feature of Yes's sound, was noticeably subdued. Tony Kay, the band's keyboardist, also had a reduced role with Rabin handling much of the keyboard parts himself. So instead of the usual interplay between the musicians, we got something that felt more like Rabin's solo project, with Anderson on vocals. Now that's not to say that the album doesn't have good moments, but it's missing the richness that comes from this more balanced collaborative effort. For the second point, let's talk about the album's musical direction, or rather, the lack of a clear one. Now, Yes had always been a band that could evolve and adapt to different sounds. Their transition from the complex, progressive rock of the 1970s to the more accessible, really pop-infused rock of the 1980s is a perfect example. But on this album, they seem to struggle with which direction to fully commit to. Let's have a look at some examples. You've got John Anderson, who's always been interested in expansive spiritual and somewhat really mystical themes. Ideas that fit well with the longer, more intricate compositions. Now, yes, we're known for this in the 1970s. And Anderson wanted to continue exploring those concepts. But Rabin, on the other hand, was more focused on creating perhaps a polished, radio friendly rock sound. Now, he'd been responsible for bringing Yes their biggest commercial success with songs like Owner of a Lonely Heart. And he was trying to replicate that formula. What you do get on talk is a bit of a tug of war. On one hand, you've got tracks like The Calling and Walls, which lean heavily into that accessible 
pop rock sound. On the other, you've got the album's epic track, Endless Dream. And this one tries to recapture the complexity of Yes's progressive roots. The problem is that these two styles don't blend seamlessly. Instead, it feels like two different albums fighting for space. For long-time fans of Yes's progressive rock era, the simpler, more radio-friendly tracks felt underwhelming, while newer fans who'd come aboard in the 1980s might have found the more experimental elements really quite hard to latch onto. In short, Talk was trying to be too many things at once, and he's ended up not fully satisfying either group. Let's look at another area now by shifting gears and talk about what was happening behind the scenes with the album's release and promotion. Because really, this is where the business side of things plays a huge role normally. A talk was released on Victory Music, and now this is a, a smaller label that just didn't have the marketing resources of a major player like Atlantic Records, which had previously supported Yes. Now, Victory Music was found by Phil Carson, who had a long history with the band, but despite his efforts, the label wasn't able to give Tool the promotional push it needed to compete in the mid-90s music scene. So think about what was happening in 1994. Grunge and alternative rock were at their peak. Bands like Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden and Alice in Chains. These bands were all dominating the charts and the radio airwaves. Now their raw, unpolished sound was a far cry from the more polished, meticulously produced sound of talk. And the reality is... Yes, just weren't able to tap into the same level of cultural relevance. They were trying to promote a slick, radio-friendly album in an era where the appetite for that kind of sound had significantly waned. Now, The Calling did get some radio play, and it's a solid track, but the album as a whole never really gained much traction. Without that major label support, and with the change in musical tastes, it really didn't stand much of a chance commercially. Which brings us to one of the album's biggest missed opportunities. So another fascinating point to look at is the production itself. Now one of the most interesting things about Tour is that it was one of the first albums to be recorded entirely using digital technology. Trevor Rabin was a pioneer in this area using a Macintosh computer and digital performer software, really to compose and arrange much of the music. Now, in today's world, digital recordings is standard, but back in 1994, this was still relatively new territory. So, Rabin's use of the digital audio workstations allowed him to have total control over the album's sound. He could layer parts, manipulate MIDI tracks, and fine-tune the arrangements in ways that really traditional analogue recording didn't allow. And while that level of control resulted in a very polished and precise sound, it also led to one of the album's major weaknesses. It actually felt too mechanical at times. Yes, his music, especially in their work in the 70s, had always been praised for its organic, dynamic quality. The interplay between live instruments, the way they could improvise and explore different sonic landscapes. With talk, much of that energy is lost in the pursuit of perfection. The digital production, while innovative, feels cold and a bit too clean. You can hear it particularly on the more ambitious tracks like Endless Dream, where the song's progressive ambitions really is somewhat undercut by the sterile nature of the digital production. The warmth, spontaneity and human element that characterised Yes's earlier work were replaced by something that felt more robotic. And for many listeners, 
This was a step in the wrong direction. It was a step too far. Finally, let's address the commercial reception of talk, because this ties everything together. Now, when talk was released, it failed to achieve the kind of commercial successes that the band had enjoyed with albums like 90125 or even Big Generator. Now, part of that failure is due to the lack of strong promotion, as we discussed. But it's also tied to the fact that Tour didn't resonate with a wide enough audience. But yes, his older fan base, those who had followed them through the 1970s, Talk didn't offer enough of the progressive complexity that they loved. They'd always been a band that pushed the boundaries of rock with long, intricate compositions and virtuosic musicianship. Now, while talk had its moments, tried to recapture that, the overall sound leaned too heavily into the kind of slick, commercial production that really didn't sit well with this crowd. On the flip side, fans who had come aboard during the 90125 era and were looking for more radio-friendly rock songs found the progressive elements of the album to be too much in trying to appeal to both audiences yes it ended up with a kind of no man's land too pop for the prog crowd and too prog for the pop crowd and in a musical landscape dominated by alternative rock and grunge this album talk just didn't fit so was it all down to Rabin was he the chief culprit well certainly he exerted a lot of restrictions on the creative control side. He composed most of the material, played large parts of it himself, and really pushed the band more into a, an AOR type of band. He failed to take into consideration the change in musical trends to grunge rather than mechanically clean rock. He also failed to diffuse the internal tensions within the band and probably fueled them in many respects. He over-relied on the newer technology too, much to the detriment of the contributions of the whole band. He wasn't responsible, however, for the small label not being big enough to give the band and the music the necessary kick up the bum to get some decent coverage. All in all, though, he was considerably responsible for so much of the problems with this one. Now he left the band shortly after 1995 to concentrate on writing film scores until that glorious return this year, sorry last year actually, with his solo album Rio, about 12 months ago it is now. But returning back to the album Torp, after not performing well on the charts, it wasn't helped by the fact that the band's tour was only really moderately successful. In the end, it became an album that tried to balance innovation with commercial ambition, but really couldn't quite pull it all together. It's a fascinating moment in Yes's history, marking both the end of the Trevor Rabin era and the band's attempt to remain relevant in a rapidly changing musical world. I hope you've enjoyed the video and click the like, subscribe and notifications bell so as never to miss out on new releases to the channel. I thank you very much for watching this one and I'll see you all again soon. Bye for now.